Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rainy night. I want to welcome you to the President's Dream Colloquium that Simon Fraser University is offering. This is our third speaker. And my name is Naomi Krogman. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Environment. And I have the pleasure of working with a group of students that are part of this colloquium um, and with Dana Lepofsky, who is um, a renowned archaeology professor who has taken the lead on inviting different speakers and um, different participants for our class as well that goes along with this colloquium. Uh, before we begin with our um, distinguished speaker, I want to acknowledge we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, KK, Kwantlen, Semiahu, and Tuasin peoples on whose traditional territories our three campuses reside. We are grateful to the ancestors of this land for our safe passage to work here and offer that we are also grateful for the opportunity to learn more from indigenous peoples here and elsewhere on local community perspectives on sustainability and resilience. Tonight, we have Dr. Charlotte Cote. She is a professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. She is from the Nuchanoth community of Shayshot on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Dr. Cote has dedicated her personal and academic life to creating awareness around indigenous health and wellness issues and in working with indigenous peoples and communities in revitalizing their traditional food ways. Her current book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sockeye in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast, 2022, examines how cultural foods play a major role in the physical, emotional, spiritual, and dietary wellness of the peoples. She is also the author of the book Spirits of Our Wailing Ancestors, Revitalizing Maka and Nuchanoth Traditions. And she's an author of numerous articles. Dr. Cote serves as a series editor of the UW Press Indigenous Confluence series, and she is also the founder and chair of UW's annual Living Breath of Indigenous Foods Symposium. Please, let's welcome Dr. Cote. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, greetings, everyone. Uklama Lotis Mayof, Zisha Aksuma, Histak Shitla Tsuma As, Nuchano Latin. So I'm sharing with you in my language, in our Nuchano language, my Koas or indigenous name, which is Lotis um, or Lotis Mayof. It means carrying thunder. It's part of my whaling heritage, the Maka and Nuchanoth peoples on the west coast of um, uh, Vancouver Island and, west, and Washington State. We were traditional whalers. Um, I am from an area called Zuma'as. It's also the name of a very important river that brings salmon into our community. And it is where the town of Port Alberni is situated. We are part of the larger nation of New Channel, which are 14 individual groups on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island. And we're all communities that share a language, share um, a culture, and also share the tradition of hunting whales. So thank you all for being here today. Put my glasses on, I can't see anything with that. So I want to also acknowledge um, the uh, first peoples of the land where the SFU, where this downtown campus is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, the uh, Tsleil-Waututh, um, and the Musqueam peoples. 
the uh, peoples of this area. And I also want to acknowledge that I don't live in my traditional territory. I teach at the University of Washington. I've been there for 21 years and I um, live and reside in the traditional territories and the shared waters of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the um, Puyallup, Tulalip, um, people that are, are recognized as Coast Salish. And so I want to acknowledge that as well. I also want to just say a few things about the um, about these photos and the photos that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, a lot of the photos that I'm sharing um, are connected to my book, connected to the stories that I share in my book. And so these are some of the, some of the photos. The photos on the left are harvesting photos. Um, the photo on the right is a photo of my recent book. And the photo in the middle is a photo that I just took last month. That's all the salmon that my sister Gail and I uh, jarred. And I spent a wonderful eight weeks back home in my community, which was um, usually I'm home every couple of months, but because of COVID, I couldn't go home. It was the longest I had ever stayed away from my community in um, my many years on this, uh, on this earth, and it was very, very difficult. So I spent the entire summer back home, and most of the time I was out in the water fishing with my sister. I'm going to start with this story, and this is a story in my book, and for the students who are here and who are part of the Dream Colloquium, you would have read this story. It's the first story that I share in my book. And um, it's a story about picking kalkawi, um, which in our language is uh, wild trailing blackberries. And it's a story of uh, picking, a berry picking adventure with my auntie Eileen, or as everyone knows her, my auntie Miss Bun. So I'm going to read this story and then tell you why um, I chose to start the book with it. Okay. And the story, which, oh, I don't have the title of it. It's called Shut Up, We're Bonding, which is the name of this <laughs> story. Um, and I'm going to have to put my reading glasses on here. On a hot summer day, my auntie Mispin and I were doing what we had always done since I was a young girl. We were driving on winding, dusty gravel roads up steep mountains in the Hahohli, or our ancestral homelands, of my people, the Tsishat, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, on our quest for the sweet and delectable Kultkawi, the wild trailing blackberry. These kalkawi are quite different than the tupkapea, the Himalayan blackberry, that were brought here from Europe and grow alongside the roads close to urban centers. The kalkawi is much smaller, hardier, and considerably, considerably richer in antioxidants than its tame cousins, and it's high in vitamin C, potassium, magnesium, and other flavonoid phytochemicals. It grows high in the mountains in flat areas within the dense coastal rainforest that blanket the northwest coast. It almost seems like a misnomer to call Kalkawi wild. The Nuchanalflat, or the Nuchanalth people, like other indigenous peoples, cultivated lands in our Hahothli to encourage growth of certain food plants. And this was done through sophisticated, selective, and controlled burning promoting the growth and production of berry vines. But through colonization and forced placement on reserve lands, we lost many of our traditional harvesting sites, which fell under the control of forest companies, and as a result, we lost our ability to engineer the lands for production. However, this ancestral knowledge continued to be transferred through the generations, and my grandfather, Huey, Auntie Mispin's father, was raised with the understanding and ecological knowledge of land burning. Grandpa would drive through our former, former harvesting sites and take note of where the forestry companies were slash burning to remove the underbrush to make it easier to cut trees and remove the fallen logs. He knew that in a few years, these would be ideal growing areas for the Kulfkowi. Grandpa passed on his cultural knowledge to us, especially the knowledge of where to find the best nutshu or best berry patch. But this afternoon was not a day for finding a good nutshu. And there we were, hours later, still looking for one. 
The day shifted into the late afternoon and I was getting tired of looking for Kulkoe, which seemed to be a hopeless situation. I was about ready to tell my auntie we should just give up and go home. And then my auntie steered around a slight bend in the gravel road and there it was, a few yards ahead of us on the right side of the road, a nutshoe. My aunt slammed on the vehicle brakes and hastily pulled over to the side of the narrow road. Since the sun was already going down on this side of the mountain, we needed to hurry. We grabbed our berry picking, our berry picking pails out of the trunk of the car and ran to the small patch of ripe, deep purple kulkui just waiting to be plucked from their hardy vines. I found a comfortable spot close to the road and Auntie Mispin made her way through the vines to start picking from the other side of the patch, about 20 feet away. And then we began picking to our heart's content. My head was down, my fingers were going a mile a minute, and my thoughts were lost in berry picking heaven. We'd been picking for about 15 minutes when I suddenly felt my aunt rush past me. I pulled my head up from the vines to ask what the heck was going on. What's the matter, I queried. Sometimes when we were picking berries, we'd run into bears that were also enjoying a berry feast. And while they usually didn't bother us, we had to be cautious if we encountered a mother with her cubs, and as she likely would not want us to come close to her or them. But I looked around and I didn't see any. Bees, bees, Auntie Mispin yelled, madly swatting at the air around her head as she ran toward our vehicle. My aunt had stepped right into the middle of a nest. What the hell, I gasped. I actually said something different, but for my book I say what the hell. <laughs> what the hell, I gasped. I grabbed my pail and stumbled to my feet, spilling all the juicy berries I was dreaming about eating when I got home. I sprinted behind my aunt while swatting at the bees that were now after me. We, drew, we got into the vehicle and, and jumped inside. Auntie Mispin started the car and we drove off, leaving behind the bees and leaving behind most of our kalkawi. By this time I had enough and I was ready to, call it a, ready to call it a day because I was tired, I was hungry, and I was aching from the couple of bee stings I received. But not my Auntie Mispin. She wanted her kalkawi in the boiling sun, the dust, the dirt, the hunger, and a few bee stings weren't going to keep her from getting them. I looked at my aunt and said, it's hopeless, why don't we just go home? This is crazy, we're never going to find any more berries. My aunt responded, shut up, we're bonding. <laughs> and with a trickle of sweat running down her cheek, a slight smile on her lips and a persistent look in her eyes, she continued driving up the mountain. <clears throat> so in my book, um, in my new book, I share many, many stories, um, berry picking stories, um, harvesting stories, uh, stories of fishing, which I have many, many stories. Um, and, um, these stories focus on Sishad as well as other Northwest Coast Indigenous communities' food traditions. In framing my book within Indigenous narrative, within these Indigenous narratives, I cultivate a food, food history that centers our voices and positions our bodies as libraries of cultural knowledge passed down through the generations. Indigenous stories are powerful. And storytelling can be understood as an act of resistance to settler colonialism. I share stories as a theoretical framework for understanding who we are as Tzishat, as Nuchanalhuat, and as Indigenous people. I share many stories from my personal life and stories that have been shared with me over the years from Tzishat and other Nuchanal uh, people, as well as other Northwest Coast peoples. And through these stories, I really want readers to understand why we, Zishat, and other indigenous peoples worldwide are revitalizing our food ways and reconnecting with our ha'um, our cultural food, by enacting food sovereignty. Enacting food sovereignty is positioned within our cultural, or excuse me, within our cultural resurgence movements we're experiencing in our indigenous communities, within our struggles for 
decolonization and sustainable self-determination, and is central to restoring health and wellness in our communities. But realizing food sovereignty, especially here in the Northwest Coast, um, it, there are many, many, many challenges to enacting food sovereignty. Pollution, habitat destruction, fish farms, environmental degradation, and climate change threaten the ecosystems where these sacred, where these sacred relations um, have thrived for millennia. And I'm going to talk about that as I move through this, through, through this PowerPoint. This photo I want to mention, and I, I talk about it again at the end of the, um, at the, end of the chapter. Um, it's a photo that was taken from um, my aunt who went berry picking. It wasn't when we went out. In fact, it was because we would never took photos. And my aunt and I would always say after we went berry picking, especially when we'd find a lot of berries, why weren't we out there taking photos of these? And we'd say that after we used them or had given them away. And so when I told her I was writing a book and I was going to have a lot of stories about berry picking, she says, well, we need some photos. So she um, asked my cousin, uh, Melanie, her uh, niece, uh, Melanie Breaker, to take her out and go out berry picking. And they went out and ended up finding this amazing nut chew, this major, amazing berry patch. And uh, she found all of these photos, and she was so excited. And she says, Melanie, take lots of photos. We're going we're gonna to be famous. We're going to have these photos in Charlotte's book. And so Melanie took this photo. Look at her hands. They're just purple from, from picking the berries. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful photo because um, a year after my aunt had passed away, she had cancer uh, a few years before. Um, it went into remission and came back. and. Um, she, this was her last berry picking trip, so it's um, to me it holds it holds a lot. There are a lot of memories because I picked berries and um, was with my aunt a lot. She was like my older sister. So who we are? Who am I? Well, it's a shot uh, or it's a shot in our. Uh, in the way that we would pronounce it, but um, we do use the word Zishat. We are one of the 14 groups that make up the larger New Channeled Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. The middle photo shows all of the traditional territories, and this is a map from my book, um, or all the traditional communities and their territories, or Hahohli, and I have the uh, English spelling of their names as well as the uh, uh, our spelling um, in our language. The square that you see on the map of Vancouver Island, that is what is we recognize as our traditional, or Hohothli, our traditional territory, ancestral territory. The map on the right shows um, a particular area of our, our territory, the Broken Group Islands. Have any of you been to the Broken Group? Quite a few of you. It's absolutely beautiful there. It's beautiful territory. It's where we had summer villages, where we, we hunted whales, where we did a lot of harvesting, especially for seafood. But following colonization in the mid-1800s, we were eventually forced into what was our winter village, which is just outside of what became the town of Port Alberni, and that's where our main reserve is now, even though we do still hold reserves or hold lands within the Broken Group. There's an area on one of the islands, the island is now known as Benson. Um, this colonization was a lot about erasing um, our uh, presence, erasing our names uh, for certain areas, and they did that in our community. We know this um, island or a particular spot on the island as Tsisha. Um, and it is now referred to as Benson Island. But there's a place, if you walk into the island, about 15 minute walk, there's a place there where our elders say we were created. So it's a very sacred place, a very important place to us. And it was also a very important whaling site, which is the name Tsisha literally means the place that reeks of whale remains. So I always say that, I guess we're the people and the place that reeks of whale remains. <laughs> Oh, and then the photo on the top is a beautiful, um, uh, our beautiful administration building that we had um, built uh, to honor the, uh, 
architectural traditions of the northwest coast of, uh, of the longhouse post and beam structure. So my New Channel community of Tishad is situated within this area that's been defined as the Northwest Coast, extending over 1,400 miles, encompassing the jagged coastlines of, the sou of southeastern Alaska, um, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon states, as well as a small area in Northern California. It's an area that's been characterized as a, the land of salmon and cedar and I think a really good characterization. It was home to one of the most diverse indigenous um, um, cultures in the world, nations that flourished in the abund abundance of marine mammals and dense vegetation, in an area known for very mild winters and very moist summers. So we're starting to see a lot of changes to that as a result of climate change, however. But the, the biological diversity created a, an abundance of foods along the Northwest Coast, which we and other coastal nations harvested by fishing, hunting, uh, trapping, gathering, cultivating, um, especially con cultivating plants and uh, medicines. The harvesting, cultivation, preparation, sharing, and trading of our ha'um was conducted within our own prescribed cultural values based on respect, reciprocity, interdependency, and ecological sustainability. <clears throat> our food systems um, functioned in very healthy interde interdependent relationships with our environment and were maintained through the active participation in traditional land and food systems. The kinds and quantities of ha'um that were available to us were dependent on keeping this symbiotic relationship strong and healthy and was maintained through the transfer of traditional ecological knowledge, monitoring the environmental health and species diversity as stewards and protectors. As a result, our traditional foodways are enmeshed in the ecosystems in which we thrive. When I was growing up, a good portion of my daily diet, and still consists of, uh, varieties of the ha'um, um, that, um, that the cultural foods that um, grow and uh, live in our ha'uthi, on the nisma on the land. We frequently ate salmon, halibut, um, many kinds of seafood, deer and moose meat. Many people still stay connected to these foods. Um, a lot of berries, different kinds of plants, which we harvest and still harvest and process. And I was, so I, I was raised on very healthy foods, eating salmon or seafood three or four times a week, accompanied by wild berries, as well as fruit from the orchards behind my grandparents' home that was planted by Indian agents in the late 1800s when they were attempting to make us into farmers. And you know, you're just looking at these photos. Why would we become farmers? I mean, look at the beauty of this, these foods. And I don't know, is that me making all that noise? <laughs> oh, is that what it is? OK, sorry about that. I just realized. There we go. OK. Um, how many of you have eaten these? How many of you have eaten tootsie? Oh, a lot of you. Now, have you eaten it raw? Have you eaten it in a sushi place? Because I know you can get it as uni in sushi places. It's funny. <laughs> I'm not a sushi eater, but if somebody forces me to go for sushi, this is what I eat, and they always say, you eat the one thing I can't stand. <laughs> like, I love tootsie. How about sikhmu, herring spawn? Herring spawn. Okay. As my friends say when I bring it back to Seattle, because I'm always so excited about sharing my foods, and <laughs> a lot of people can barely eat it, they I always say it's an acquired taste. <laughs> Throw a little bit of salt and butter in there and <laughs> it's great. How about the wild trailing blackberry? How many of you have picked? A lot of you. It's amazing. Wonderful. And Ma'i, the salmon berry shoots? Hapo? Oh, it's so good. Oh, ma'i is so, that was the first, probably one of the first plants that I knew how to um, harvest myself because we grew up in a very rural area. There were, there's still to this day, there are no stores close to where my, where my home was. And so once we figured out what salmon berry shoots were, brought it in to show my mom and my mom said, sure, it's something you can eat. That's what we ate. It was basically our candy. It's a very, very 
nutritious, but also has a sweet taste. So it's really, really nice. How about, uh, um, well, how many of you have not eaten salmon? <laughs> how many of you had it cooked this way as kachas? I say that's the best way to eat salmon. It is so good. And this is um, kachas miyan, so sakai salmon cooked in an uh, open pit fire. And which is one of the reasons why I wanted to put that on my front cover of my book because it's such a delicacy in our community. Everybody loves to have kacha salmon. For new channel flat or new channel people, traditional ecological knowledge is grounded in our philosophies and principles of isak, of being respectful of u'athluk, to take care of, and hachatakma tsawak, also written as hishukish tsawak, which means everything is one or everything is interconnected. Our principle of Isak applies to all life forms as well as to the land and water, and at its most basic understanding, teaches that all life forms are held in equal esteem. Our relationships to the plants, to the animals that give themselves to us as food derives from Isak, to understand that, that they're giving themselves to us. Um, it enforces or reinforces sustainability and places sanctions on those who are wasteful, um, that you respect what is giving itself to you as food. The underlying vision of u'athluk is to take care of, that is to take care of the lands, to take care of everything within those lands, within our haholi, within that ancestral territory. Um, and that is consistent with our principles, with neutral principles and values, a responsibility given to us through our creator, through Nas. The principles of Isak and u'athluk are embedded within an overarching philosophy of hachatakma, Walk, which literally translates to everything is one, but we understand it as everything around us, everything within our natural worlds, within the supernatural worlds is interconnected. These principles guide our relationships with both our natural and spiritual worlds. There's no difference, the worlds connect, the worlds are one. Embodied in these philosophies is the understanding that we must honor the values of these, not of these principles, of these values in everything that we do, and maintain responsible and respectful relationships with everything within that world. Indigenous peoples have a cultural concept of food as medicine, which promotes a holistic approach to maintaining and restoring the dietary, emotional, and spiritual health of our bodies. It also means maintaining the ecosystems that provide us with nutritious foods, such as salmon. And so I've got some wonderful photos here. How many of you have had fish head soup? My favorite. <laughs> I love fish head soup. And so I've got some wonderful photos there of, of salmon. Numerous studies show how essential fatty acids derived from fish and sea mammal oils are important to reducing the risks of heart disease and type, type 2 diabetes. Omega-3 fatty acids also help reduce inflammation, which can cause heart disease, stroke, autoimmune disorders, and certain types of cancer. Omega-3 fatty acids along with omega-6 fatty acids are classified as polyunsaturated fats and research has found that their consumption supports both our physical and mental health and reduces the risk of depression, dementia, psychosis, and ADHD. And you ask any person from the Northwest Coast about foods they grew up with and the first one they most often mention is salmon, putting it at the heart of our indigenous food sovereignty. Salmon was and still is a primary food source that allows coastal cultures to flourish. And because of this, it's never taken for granted. The spirit of the salmon is celebrated through the first salmon ceremony, which honors the fish return, the fish's return each year. In the coastal indigenous uh, belief system, everything has a spirit. 
and prayers and ceremonies are conducted to show respect and gratitude to the spirits for bringing their physical bodies to our communities to feed us, which in turn ensures that their salmon relatives will continue to visit and provide the physical forms to us as food. Um, and these are two beautiful photos on the bottom. They aren't photos from my community. They are actually photos from the Lummi Nation, which, um, whose ancestral territory is the area that's now recognized as Bellingham. And Lummi have a very, very strong fish, fishing culture. And I know many, uh, have a lot of friends in the Lummi community. And this is one of the, their ceremonies they conducted, the first um, salmon ceremony. So it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how fortunate I had been to be to have been raised with my ha'om, to be raised in my culture and in my traditions, to be raised within my community, and really um, to understand the importance of staying connected to these foods, which I have done throughout my lifetime. As an indigenous food scholar, born and raised in my community, I've studied I witnessed, I've experienced how colonization, the perpetuation of settler colonialism, habitat destruction, climate change, socioeconomic marginalization, and the imposition of a Western diet have impacted my people's physical, nutritional, emotional, and spiritual health and caused us, like all indigenous peoples globally, to be food insecure. Through this complex interplay of colonial pressures and policies, traditional foods were marginalized and their use declined dramatically, especially within our diets, within our individual diets. In other words, colonization as well as settler colonialism play a key role in causing our poor health by disrupting our healthy relationships, with our ecosystem, with our traditional food ways, and transfer of ecological and ancestral knowledge. Colonial policies, such as the boarding school policy, weaken cultural practices and broke down our languages, creating, for many, a disconnect from their cultural identity. Even those who didn't attend these schools experience intergenerational trauma, exacerbating the health disparities that we see in our indigenous communities today. It's no coincidence that our communities now have the highest rates of lifestyle diseases, such as coronary heart disease, diabetes, and these being directly attributed to a change in diet, fueled by the perpetuation of settler colonialism. In analyzing settler colonialism, we cannot overlook the disturbing legacy of Indian boarding schools, or also known as residential schools, and the horrific impact that the US and Canadian Indian education policy had on indigenous culture, identity, and health. And I include in the top of this, um, in the top of my uh, slide, a uh, quote from a beautiful book Robin Kimmerer, Dr. Robin Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. How many of you have read this book? Oh, I'm so happy. It is one of the most profound books. I've never read a book where I finished each chapter or sometimes a paragraph and had to just sit with that, with her words and reflect on it. And I still remember the day when I was sitting outside reading about the Northwest Coast, when she talks about coming to the Northwest Coast, and she's um, uh, sharing how she was walking through the rainforest, and it, and it just started, there was a downpour, so she found a cedar tree that had been slightly, it had been knocked over, and there was a little space underneath where she could sit. And she sat under there, and she was just watching this little droplet forming above her. And the droplet just released itself. And when it released itself, she opened her mouth and grabbed and t um, stuck out her tongue. And she says, and it was like I was receiving it like a gift. I mean, I'm losing all the nuance of it. But I mean, I just sat there and cried. I'm like, all I would have thought was, my hair's going to get fuzzy in this rain. <laughs> Here she is writing about this beautiful raindrop. 
but she's just an amazing, amazing writer. So I wanted to include her voice here with her quote where she says, children language lands almost everything was stripped away, stolen when you weren't looking because you were trying to stay alive. What a profound statement, which is exactly what was happening in these schools, which was exactly what was happening because of this, uh, because of federal Indian policies that were being forced on us. In analyzing um, settler clo colonialism, we cannot overlook these boarding schools. And by the late 1800s, both Canada and the United States had um, adopted an educational um, system of boarding schools where indigenous youth between the ages of 5 and 15 were taken from our families and communities and placed in these institutions designed specifically to eradicate our culture and spiritual traditions, weaken our political and economic systems, eliminate our languages, and sever our children from their communities, their kin relations, and their traditional foods, all of this resulting in collective historical trauma. The photo on the right is a photo of a boarding school that was situated right in the middle of our community, of the Tzishat community. It had a six foot high chain link fence around that school. It stayed open until the late 70s. Um, I remember that school when I was a little girl. I didn't go to the school because we had already, my generation and some of the people in the generation above me were already being phased into the public school system, but that school was still there because a lot of children from northern rural communities were, were placed in that school and kept there. Not just for the 10 months that school was open, many of them couldn't make it back home during the summer months, so many of those children also just stayed within our community or ended up staying in that school. It's no longer there. The, the build, there are some buildings um, that are left from that boarding school um, uh, system that was created there, but the major, the main building, this building, was torn down, and it's now the place where our New Channel Tribal Council uh, is situated. <clears throat> Many scholars and former boarding school survivors have written about the appalling abuses that the children suffered in these schools, and I write about this in one of my chapters, um, the chapter that I write about, uh, about my sister, who, um, who has a garden just in front of this building as a way to heal that land. She wanted to put something there that, that would trigger wonderful mem or wonderful feelings in people who would go to that space and be triggered by their bad memories that they had attending that school. Um, the uh, uh, stories of the survivors, I mean, we wrote a book, the New Channel Tribal Council has a book, a narrative, uh, boarding school narratives, and there isn't one story in that book that is a nice story, that is a happy story. They're stories of abuse, and in the last 20 years, the survivors of these schools have begun to share their stories. Um, stories of trauma, because it, it's now sharing as a way to heal, to heal and try to move forward and reconcile with that past. But it's really only been in recent years that we've seen research that, that connects contemporary indigenous health issues with the boarding school system and the forced dietary change on these children, on the indigenous children that were attending those schools. In the schools, in, uh, indigenous children were required to eat foods that many had never eaten before. Foods um, such as domesticated meats, cheese, wheat flour, sugar, um, and they were strange from their own traditional food. So think about that. A, a school that was right in the middle of our community where we were still out fishing, we were still out harvesting, but those children that went to those schools didn't get those kinds of foods. They were fed um, these very, very different foods, many of them for the first time eating these kinds of foods. Um, and not only did the children attend those foods, eat those um, um, very different foods, and many of the, a lot of the foods that they were um, being fed were not nutritious foods, but they were facing food insecurity. They weren't giving, being fed um, 
they were basically being underfed. Many of the children were starving. And in all the research that I have conducted throughout the years with people who had um, survivors of these schools, who had attended the schools, that was always the first thing that they shared with me, that they were always hungry. They were always hungry in these schools. Not only did so not only did the children face food insecurity by being underfed and fed unhealthy foods, in 2013, Canadian food scholar Ian Mosby exposed more of the colonial violence that was inflicted on these children. While he was conducting research on foods and nutrition in Canada in the 1940s, looking at the way foods were being processed, especially after World War II or around World War II, the rise of the processed foods and industrialization of foods, he uncovered documents that revealed how secret nutritional experiments were being conducted on malnourished indigenous children in these schools. It wasn't just that they were conducting these, um, these, um, these studies, these, these um, uh, experiments, as he calls them, nutritional experiments, the children didn't know that they were part of these experiments, and the parents were never, ever consulted or asked or given approval. It's not an, an overstatement to say that the bodies of these children be were being colonized from the inside out. In 2008, Canada formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was created to investigate former residential school policies and operations, and to support former students and their families in the process of healing and reconciliation. In 2015, the TRC report was released, and many of the findings affirmed what former boarding school students had already said about the atrocities that they faced in these schools, especially the food insecurity and hunger they experienced. The report revealed that the issue of hunger and inadequate and unhealthy foods being fed to the students was known by the administrators of these schools, yet nothing was done about it. Disrupted environments, climate change, and environmental contamination and degra degradation have also had profound impacts on Indigenous health and well-being, and no one is more susceptible to these damaging effects than Indigenous women. Recent studies have demonstrated a direct correlation between violence on Indigenous homelands from mining, forestry, fracking, and other destructive industries, and violence on indigenous women and their bodies. <clears throat> In the report, which is where I, I um, got this quote from, very, very important report. You can find it online. The entire re report is online. It's called Violence on Our Lands, Violence on Our Bodies. Amanda Lickers from the Turtle Clan Seneca says, if you're destroying and poisoning the things that give us life, the things that shape our identity, the places that we're from and the things that sustain us, then how can you not be poisoning us, indigenous women? How can that not be a direct violation against our bodies, whether that be respiratory illness or cancer or liver failure or the inability to carry children? Very, very strong quote, quote, very powerful quote. There's also been direct links to the violence um, with, uh, along with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, these uh, man camps that um, are created around a lot of these industries and the women and a lot of these industries that are close to indigenous communities and the indigenous women um, um, being, um, uh, um, uh, impacted, impacted by, by the, the violence, violence, by violence from those man camps. Pollution, urban, urban development, development, pipelines, recreational activities, fish farms, fish habitat, habitat destruction, destruction, all continually threaten our cultural foods. They threaten our health and they threaten the health of our waterways and our homelands. Environmental degradation, such as water contamination, construction of hydroelectric dams, Biodiversity loss, these are all key factors in the decline of indigenous foodways, along with 
climate change and ocean acidification, and we're seeing major, major changes here in the northwest coast, especially with ocean acidification, with the warming of the waters, with species, invasive species coming into these areas, threatening the species that have thrived here, which our cultures have thrived on, and creating a lot of instability here in our foodways and in the food systems in the Northwest Coast. Especially here in the Northwest Coast in BC and in Washington State, what we're seeing that has had major, major consequences on our foodways is marine net pan Atlantic salmon elk aquaculture. Um, there's been a lot written about it. There have been um, a lot of uh, a lot of movement, especially here in BC, with B BC it being a topic of conversation in BC politics about removing or at least phasing out um, these uh, fish farms as well. We're seeing these conversations in Washington State, where where I live, um, and for good reason. The Atlantic salmon are kept in cramped pens, making them susceptible to the spread of disease. These are um, on the BC, on the coastline, and I have a map that shows some of the fish farms um, uh, here on the BC coastline. The pesticides and antibiotics used to treat these fish, uh, to, used to fish, treat the diseases in these fish as well as food and feces runoff spread into the open water, into our waters, into these shared waters, and contaminate the coastal um, ecosystem, contaminating water in which our cultures are embedded. So I want to look at the industrial food industry um, and then look at what I mean when I, talk, when, I meant, when I talk about food sovereignty and what that means. The UN's Food and Agricultural Organization defines food security as a situation that exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food prefer preferences for an active and healthy life. But in 2019, of the more than 7.7 billion people in the world, almost half experienced food shortages and food insecurity. And, there's, and I go into a more depth in this in, in the intro chapter of my book in why that is. What is food being, created, being, being um, grown for? Um, well, for profit, for one, because it has been um, made into a commodity. And also, a lot of the fuel ends up going into agri-fuel. And a lot of it ends up going into animal feed, because we stop feeding animals what they should be eating. Um, so we see a lot of, uh, a lot of these changes in the food industry um, that results in food insecurity, global, food insecurity globally. This food insecurity largely stems from the global shifts in food production, which resulted in a move, the, the move away from small um, polyculture farming to more industrialized and a capitalist mode of food production that focuses on monoculture agriculture, growing um, soya, growing wheat, growing corn, um, and then seeing those uh, foods being industrialized. Corn, you see um, modified corn or corn, um, uh, different uses of corn in so many um, processed foods. Um, uh, high fructose corn syrup, for example, you see in a lot of foods. Um, another issue that we have is genetically modified uh, foods, and if you don't know about Monsanto, and I hope you all do, and I'm sure you do, you seem like people who would know. I'm not going to go into depth about uh, Monsanto, but genetically engineered um, seeds really um, damaging these um, uh, the seed saving and the sharing of seeds that many people do, especially indigenous communities. Um, and as a result, we're, we're facing you know, these issues of, of insecurity. And I tell my students, you look at these, you know, you go into a grocery store, the food that you have on the left side of the grocery store and the food you have on the right is what we call food. Fruits, vegetables, grains, um, meat, seafoods. The foods in the middle, the majority of those foods are processed. Just look at the packages. And um, I tell my students, if you don't understand that word, don't eat it. <laughs> 
there's so many foods on our shelves that are, uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, that aren't food, that aren't real food. A 2019 study estimates that one in five deaths globally are associated with a Western diet high in salt, sugar, and fat, and high levels of red and processed meats. And, um, you know, and it doesn't mean just red meat in general, and I have these conversations with my students in my classrooms. Um, my family eat a lot of meat, but they, they eat um, uh, elk that is hunted naturally, as well as deer. Um, but the way that foods um, or meats um, and meat products in, the, in our countries, especially in the United States and Canada, um, it's not just that the foods, that they're unhealthy and how they're being processed, even the way that the, the killing of those animals, the way animals are killed for food um, is, um, uh, I mean, it's just really, really sad what is happening in the industry and there's many, many um, people who have written about this and there's also some really, really important documentaries about the industrialized food system. And this, um, um, the uh, diagram on the, on the uh, left, I think, really speaks to where we are today when it comes to industrialized food. Um, people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. And so for us, for indigenous peoples, we've really um, uh, seen uh, major, major changes in our communities and in our diets as a result of the uh, imposition of a Western diet. Um, also globally, when we think, when we look at um, uh, the uh, studies, especially recent studies, a 2017 study estimated that 11 million deaths in the world were just attributed to a poor diet. Think about that, that it's created the highest risk factor than any other factors in the world and the kinds of foods that we're eating today. A growing e epidemic of lifestyle diseases is also occurring in indigenous communities. We're seeing high rates of, of diabetes, especially in our youth. Um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, autoimmune diseases, obesity, and also a rise in cancers. Um, we're seeing those rises in other populations, but we're seeing them even more so. In fact, four times um, uh, indigenous peoples are more, four times more likely to suffer from type two diabetes than the non-indigenous population. So that brings me to food sovereignty and which where I situate a lot of the research that I'm doing today. We've seen a rise of the um, indigenous foods and food sovereignty movements, especially in the last 20 years. This correlates with the cultural resurgence, mo resurgence movements and self-determination movements that we're experiencing in our communities throughout the world. These movements are positioned within the larger struggle to decolonize our homelands and re reviving and restoring indigenous food ways, reclaiming autonomy over our foods goes hand in hand with decolonization by resisting unhealthy foods that are forced on us. Something that I looked at in my last chapter of my, my um, previous book, Spirits of Our Wailing Ancestors, where I talk about this being a form of culinary imperialism or food hegemony. Food sovereignty is defined as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And the um, agrarian um, and small, uh, small farmer collective, um, a global uh, organization, La Via Campesina, uh, created this definition that many people use today, created what is recognized as the classic definition of food sovereignty. In my work, I look at what it means to indigenize that concept. What does it mean to indigenize food sovereignty? It really moves it beyond it just being a right, being a political right, or that governments recognize we have a political or a legal right to our foods. It places emphasis back in our communities and on our responsibility 
the mutuality, the kinship, the relationships that we have with our natural world. And Dawn Morrison, who is from this area, if you ever get a chance, you see that she is out there giving a talk. Go and check out uh, her work. She works with the Working Group on Indigenous um, uh, working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty here in British Columbia. She was one of the first um, indigenous uh, people to start looking at the concept of food sovereignty and how it could inform her work. She is urban-based. She does live here in Vancouver, but she is from the Sequimp, um community and it does amazing, amazing work. She has uh, a project called the Salmon Caravan, if any of you have heard of it, one of her really, really important um, projects that she, um, an organ, um, movement here in the, in the Vancouver area. She uh, says that indigenous food sovereignty really is embedded within an indigenous philosophy and worldview that unlike Western and Christian concepts of humans having authority over all living things, it understands that the human ecosystem, excuse me, the human ecosystem relationship is one of reciprocity and res respect, very, very similar to what Robin Kimmer talks about, that our relationships with the world around us is based in reciprocity. So humans do not control nature, but live in harmony with it. So food sovereignty embodies a very deep spiritual appreciation for food as a sacred gift. For indigenous peoples, our physical, social, spiritual, emotional health are directly tied to our ability to eat our traditional foods. And this really goes back to the story that I started with about my aunt. Um, I never ever under, really understood when we were out picking berries what she meant about us bonding. And it wasn't until years later that I understood what it wasn't just about the berry picking, it was about us connecting, it was about us staying together, it was about us sharing that experience as we were harvesting one of our traditional foods. And it's really important to understand that, that it's not just about being eating those foods, it's about the harvesting, the processing, the sharing, the protecting that becomes important and is, is um, at the at the ground, at, at, the, at the basic levels of what we mean by food sovereignty. So restoring our traditional food practices really allows us to experience, experience that special connection to our culture, to those foods and to those homelands where those foods grow and where those foods live. Valerie Seacrest and Elise Crone wrote this beautiful book, Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit. Um, they were one of the, they, they were, probably the first two people in the uh, Washington state area to also really look at food ways, traditional food ways, and the importance of revitalizing food traditions. And they say that there is really this sense of vitality and belonging that comes with eating these foods that provided our ancestors with health and longevity. So indigenous food sovereignty then emphasizes the importance of not just having access to those land, to those foods, it's having access to those lands. So it connects to this new movement we're seeing um, in our communities called the Land Back Movement. And I don't know, I have, do, yes, you all get access to Hulu in Canada, right? Anybody watching Reservation Dogs? Oh my, you remember the Land Back episode? <laughs> If you haven't watched it and you can get it here, you have to watch Reservation Dogs. First series ever that was produced, directed, written, and acted by all indigenous actors. Just absolutely wonderful. And uh, one of my classes, that's all we did was watch that. Good way to teach. We're going to watch Reservation Dogs through this class. <laughs> Students loved it. I did too. So enacting food sovereignty. Traditional foods have become a potent cultural symbol as indigenous peoples recognize that eating our foods, eating our cultural foods, making the choice to eat those foods is in itself a political act, a resistance to settler colonialism. Food sovereignty is intricately linked to cultural sovereignty and as an Ojibwe, 
writer and environmentalist, activist Winona LaDuke says, you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourself. So today, many indigenous peoples throughout Canada, throughout the United States, are re-indigenizing re their diets, connecting back to their foods or connecting to healthy foods. Many people are starting community gardens. And I do have um, a photo here, and this is also from one of the chapters in my book. My sister Gail, uh, Gail Gus, here with the children from our Tatneist in our language. Tatneist means little children. The Tatneist daycare, and she's teaching them how to harvest plants. This is this garden is right in front of that building that I showed you, that boarding school. Um, and when she she said when she first started, um, when she first decided to to grow her garden there, everybody in the community was like, "Are you kidding? Why would you want to put a garden there?" And uh, her thought was, "Well, you know, we just need we need first to have." garden, a garden where we can grow nutritious foods, but we need to stop just looking at that place and having it re-traumatize us. We need to put something there where people will be excited to come back to that space, because it still is, it's in our hopefully, it's in our, in our nitzma, in our land. So she said they couldn't even put a shovel when her and her and Aaron Woodward, the, uh, the young man who has helped her with this, uh, garden when they were trying to till the land. They couldn't even put the shovel in the ground. That's how hard the land was. But they did it. They, they kept working on it and eventually uh, planted. And her kale, I'm not joking, her kale was like this. That land needed to, he to heal. It was like Jurassic Park kale. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And so throughout the years, she ended up Every time I would go home, she'd say, sis, you got to come and check out my garden. And one day, we were walking through the garden, and I said, it's really, you know, this is so important to decolonization. And she turned around and laughed at me, because people in our communities don't word, don't use this word. It's like decolonization. You know, she's like, it's all about me surviving. And she says, that land needed to heal. The plants needed to see that land heal. The trees around here needed to see that land heal. And every year that garden has grown and grown. That's enacting food sovereignty. That's important. Up in the top left, and I'm going to talk more about that um, just in a minute, because I have a little video to show. That's me and my auntie Marilyn, Marilyn Watts. And uh, we are getting fish ready to go into our little smokehouse there on the right. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate to be around people who have always um, been very um, uh, wanting to share their knowledge. And Marilyn, Auntie Marilyn's been one of those people um, who loves sharing her knowledge. She makes the best upsqui, the best dried salmon jerky in the world. Um, the photo on the top in the middle and on the bottom in the middle, um, that was one of, uh, day we went out harvesting. That's Nitanis Desjardins from my community. My, sec my last chapter, I write about her and her family who took a year out of their lives to live off the grid, to live off the land as a part of, of reconnecting to the foods, to traditional foods, very important um, to them. She talks, uh, and they, they were very candid about sharing the uh, challenges they experienced in doing that. And she said, you know, and when I talked to them and said I wanted to do a chapter about her and her family, her six kids at the time, they now, they have 10 kids now. Um, she said, well, we're not gonna romanticize this. We're gonna tell you exactly what happened. And it's very, just an incredible story, but very, very powerful for a story of food sovereignty. The photo in the middle is a photo that I took, I can't remember, that was this year, a couple of years ago, but it's our community fish day, our communal fish day, where we all get together with a um, communal net, and all the fish that's brought in is divided, and we, one of those days, we specifically divide, or catch the fish and divide the fish for our elders. And the photo, again, on the top is my auntie, uh, um, and connecting to berries, very important for us and our uh, food sovereignty. The photo on the bottom right is a photo of me and my sister, Sister Gail, and if we have time, I'll share a story about uh, our uh, fishing adventures. Believe me, we have many, 
and those, those are the, the ones, ones I've had to edit down, down because I cannot quote exactly what we say when we're out on the boat. Because have you been out there for eight hours? It isn't fun and games. <laughs> and both of us swear like loggers, so a lot of editing goes into those stories. The top right is a photo from last year, and that was the first time I ever went huckleberry picking, mountain huckleberry picking. And two of my colleagues and friends, Joyce Lecomte and uh, Sarah Gonzalez, brought me out because they knew that I was I couldn't go home and um, uh, felt sorry for me and wanted to take me out. And we went up to, in the Cascade Mountains in the uh, Muckleshoot and Yakima territories. Beautiful, beautiful territory above the, above the cloud line. It was pretty amazing to be up there and to uh, pick those beautiful berries. So I have a short video I want to show, and then um, that will, and, and then a very short story. I don't know what time is that. I don't know if I was in timing myself. Oh. This is um, a three-minute video, and it's smoking fish with my Auntie Marilyn. We were um, smoking um, fish one day, and my uncle came out to, to see us, and uh, he says, do you want me to do a video of you guys? And I said, sure, why not do a video? So here's this video, and I think I just pressed something. Oh, spacebar. OK, so we are doing some smoking of salmon, and Auntie Marilyn already has most of the salmon cut up, and so we're making them into thin, thin slices, what we call up sweet, where you take a small part off the top, hear it? and Auntie Marilyn's teaching me how to do this, so I'm still in training. But we do, um, you just go across the top of the salmon, and these are spring salmon, with a really sharp knife and cut it really thin, and then when you pull it off, you have this nice thin piece, which will then go into the smokehouse. And it smokes to really crispy, like almost like a salmon jerky, and it lasts forever and it tastes really good. And all you do is, after you finish that, you put it on racks and put a little bit of salt on it, and it's ready to go. And that's what we have, these large spring salmons that we're working with. And then these backs are also going to go in to the smokehouse as well and get smoked so that those can be either boiled up or cooked up, however you want to cook them. But these end up getting, these are soft, these end up getting really crispy because they're so thin. Yeah. Yeah. The video. <laughs> And there's Auntie Marilyn. She's so she's cutting one off, up already. She already has um, the pieces cut out, and now she's going to be doing some up squeeze as well. So what she does first is cut off the backs, and when those backs come off, or the the bottoms, not the, the backs, belly. the bellies, and then that gets cut. That gets put in the smokehouse just like that with them. Um, those strips help it smoke because it's really thick. They're really big spring salmon. And so when you do that, it helps the smoke get into the uh, bellies, into the meat better. And so those will also be put into the smokehouse. And so we have some already going in the smokehouse. So you'll be able to see what it looks like after they're done. And so this is what the upski looks like after they're done. It's nice and crispy. They probably have, I think Auntie Marilyn said, a couple more hours. But they get really nice and crispy and then they're just almost like salmon jerky. Okay. And then these are the back that she was smoking as well and they're a little thicker. So it's a thick, thicker, soft meat in those ones. And this is her nice little smoke house that her and Uncle Rudy made. Works perfectly. Right.
bear proof. <laughs> and that's the end of my video. Thank you, Uncle Rudy, for doing the video. <laughs> Definitely bear proof. <laughs> you need it in our community. So I'm going to end with this short story. And the short the story usually I end with one of me and Gail fishing. But this is a story of me and Gail. And this was uh, taken about a month ago. And uh, it was about 2 in the morning. And we were both tired because we pulled all those spring salmon into the boat. And she just kind of fell over. And I grabbed her in my arms. And I said to our, uh, our fishing partner, Reg, you better take a photo of us before we pass out here. And so we got, got that beautiful photo. Um, so yeah, so um, Auntie Marilyn, who's now in her 70s, she had learned to smoke fish when she was very young. And she passes her knowledge on to us. And I think that's really important that we have people that do that, that are always willing to share their knowledge. And so in, as you saw in the video, I, you know, I, I'm learning. And, and hopefully, uh, as the years go by, that I'll continue to learn and get better in how I, especially in how I cut fish. Um, but it's something that I really, really enjoy doing, al along with canning salmon with my sister. A few years uh, ago, I spent the afternoon smoking fish with Auntie Marilyn. And we had cut up the salmon, placed them on the racks in the smokehouse. And, Auntie had put a few pieces, cut up a few pieces of wood and uh, made fire on the racks. And you use wood like alder, a very slow burning wood, so that it kind of just smokes. And you get a really nice smoke for um, depending on how long you want to smoke the salmon. Um, usually, as I mentioned, a couple of days, a day or a couple of days. Um, and then so when the logs get, um, begin to smoke, you close the, sa the smokehouse door and you leave it. And then you just kind of um, keep checking on it throughout, um, throughout the day and the evening. So the salmon, um, in this uh, video, we were doing two different kinds of salmon, the upsque, which you keep in a little longer so it gets really nice and, and crispy, and then the more softer salmon with the thicker pieces of meat. Um, and so we made the fire, and uh, everything was, was going well. We had everything in, this, in the smokehouse. And when we finished, um, I decided I was going to head over to my sister Gail's and go for a visit. So after visiting with my sister for a few hours, we decided to hit the small casino in the uh, town of Port Alberni next to my community and take a few spins on the slot machines. On our way to the casino, we stopped by the smokehouse so we could check on the fish. And uh, the logs had burned down, and the smoke was quite low, so we cut up some more wood and put them on the fire. Once we got a good smoke going, we gave the salmon a once over. We spent probably about 15 minutes checking the pieces of salmon to make sure the fire was smoking them adequately. And so after we were satisfied with the smoking process, we got in our vehicle, and we headed to the casino with that smoky smell still embedded in our hair and in our clothing. We were at the casino for about a half hour enjoying our slot machines when one of our elders, Geraldine, walked in. Geraldine saw me on the slot machine. She waved and then headed over to where I was sitting. I knew my hair and clothes would still reek of the smoke from being in the smokehouse. So as Geraldine approached me, I warned her. I said. I just came from the smokehouse, so I'm a little smelly. Geraldine came over to me, gave me a big hug, took in a deep breath, and said, you smell good. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charlotte. You make me want to eat salmon right now <laughs> and, and learn so much. But would you mind if we had a few questions? Oh, not at all. Okay. If we have time. I know I've gone over time. All right. Hopefully I'm going to run around and hand the microphone off. Um, who would like to ask a question of Charlotte?
Hi, Charlotte. Thank you very much for uh, the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I love hearing about just food in general, but your food is particularly good. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a question for you regarding the, the rate of diabetes in the young uh, population of, uh, of your nation. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, you said there's a discrepancy between other populations in that the increase in diabetes. Do you know why that's the case? Mm -hmm. um, we've looked in it a bit, and it's something in the research that I was doing, especially in my, uh, my previous book, I was looking at a lot of the, the rises of these kinds of certain types of diseases. Um, a lot of it is because with um, some communities, non-indigenous communities, you've had a longer time to adjust to these certain kinds of foods, or they've been in your um, in your diet for a longer period of time, where for indigenous peoples, processed foods especially, or foods like meat, um, uh, processed meats, uh, milk products, uh, uh, flour, foods made with flour, they've just been introduced in a very recent period of time. So they're impacting our bodies in a very negative way. And one of our elders who, um, he was, I think, in his 40s when he was, most of his diet was still a traditional food diet, a lot of uh, uh, plant-based foods, a lot of um, uh, seafoods, a lot of salmon, um, uh, foods rich in omega-3s especially. He said that he noticed within a 10-year period when he moved out of his very remote community in northern, on the northern part of Vancouver Island into an urban, or into an urban center in a city, within 10-year period he started developing these types of diseases and ended up with type 2 diabetes. So I think a lot of it is because our bodies just haven't adjusted to it, which is why we see those rates uh, impacting us even more than in the larger or the general population. Okay, thank yeah. you. That's, I, I had a bit of that idea in mind, and you were talking about also how uh, your food is, well, salmon is rich in omega-3, berries, antioxidant, and I, it just got me thinking, shouldn't everybody keep healthy like that? You yeah. know, we talk about eating those kind of foods. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe like you said, uh, we're a bit more adjusted to these foods. That's why maybe it takes a bit more time for them to catch up for on our health, mm -hmm. but maybe we just shouldn't be eating those foods either. You yeah, know, so. and a lot of it is, and this is something that I'm doing my new research for the next book project I'm working on, is how we look at a lot, we look at addictions, and when we look at addictions, we usually look at like drug addiction, alcohol addiction, there's other gambling addictions after I talk about casinos. <laughs> um, there's, but we rarely ever look at food as an, an addiction. And I really want to look at this, and I, man, I can't remember the name of the author, but I, I purchased a book a couple of months ago called um, Your, uh, Your Brain on Food. And it's all about the addictions that we have to certain foods. And a lot of it is because it's no coincidence you get addicted to foods like Coca-Cola. They put billions of dollars into researching what will attract you and what will really get your taste buds to want something. You know, what, what addicts you to foods? And I know so many people in my community who tell me they can't live without Coca-Cola. You know, and I, I've been very fortunate because my mother wasn't somebody who allowed those kinds of foods into our diets. So I don't have those addictions, but there are many people in my community and in my family that do. And so it, even though we're not being forced to eat them anymore, even though we're not in schools that are taking away those foods, it's having to, as I said, re-indigenize our diets, re-indigenize our taste buds to want to eat herring eggs rather than to want to eat McDonald's or wanting to eat um, salmon broth rather than wanting to, or drink salmon broth rather than wanting to drink Coca-Cola. It's really, a lot of it has to do with what's going on up here and to just change the way that we're looking, that, that we're, sen that, that the sensories that we have around eating foods, not just the nutritional aspect of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, we'll go with you and then we'll go to the next. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, I'm a school a student at the public policy school mm. and um, we've been looking at or, you know, I've been interested in water policy, especially in northern communities. And I recently watched a Netflix documentary called For Love that talked about the impact of residential schools on indigenous communities across Canada. Mm. And something that I found interesting, especially in Iqaluit, was the uh, lack of safe potable water and how that impacted their ability to cook uh, and to wash their vegetables, to even boil vegetables or, or pastas and, and things like that because of the chemicals in the water. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any commentary or thoughts on the relationship between uh, safe and accessible water and um, food security in indigenous communities. Hmm. No, it's that, that's one area that I have, been, I have been looked at. And I guess because I do focus on my community, we haven't seen that as an issue. Um, but um, yeah, I would love to check out some of that research being done in the northern communities about water and access to um, safe water or potable water and how that has led to food insecurity in some of those communities. But it isn't something that I have done any research in. But thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. Partly a question and partly an answer, I guess. One of the things that seems to me that most indigenous communities do not have easy access to healthy food because they're the small, in the small communities where fresh fruits and vegetables that are organic and properly grown are hard to access. Do you see a change in your communities as accessing healthy food instead of all the sugar pops and the, mm -hmm. all the sugar type bases and yeah, that, that really has been a major part of the, the Indigenous food sovereignty movement is the communal gardens or community gardens. My sister's um, garden is really, really important to that. But it's not just um, growing a garden, it's making or at least um, having people want the foods that are in the garden. And so I, when I write about her story and the, communi the Tsishak Community Garden Project, she shares with me that, you know, she put a lot of work into it in building this garden, but she couldn't get people to go there. She couldn't get people to go and, and, and harvest any of the foods or take any of the foods, the vegetables or the, um, um, the herbs and different things that she was growing there. So she started having community nights where she would go and pick the foods and then bring them to community centers and put, she made big baskets, especially for the elders and filled them with kale and carrots and squash, all the things she was growing. They're not traditional foods, but they're nutritious foods. They're not foods from the area, but they're tr uh, nutritious. She, sa she said, and I share this in my book, two of the elders came in and got their baskets and they were walking out with this really weird look on their face. And so she looked at them and said, hey, what's going on? What's wrong? And I said, well, what is this? And they pointed to the big kale and that the, she had on the top of the, the kale leaves on the top of the basket. And she said, it's kale. And one of the elders said, well, what do you do with it? She said, well, you eat it. She said, well, how? <laughs> and it never even dawned on Gail that they would never have even eaten it. It wouldn't even be part of their diet. So she started a healthy lifestyles plan. And every week, she would bring people in and teach them about the different foods, talk about the nutritional value of the foods, show them how to process the foods. She showed them how to start canning tomatoes and how to, how to make pickles and all of these. So it became this really larger movement within our community to be healthy. But what she also did, and I share this in the book, was many of the people, she knew if she could get their children that she could change their minds. So she started doing movie and smoothie night, where she would have a movie outside on a big screen and bring all the kids, and then she'd make smoothies made out of, out of kale and spinach. And when she first told the kids what was in them, they're like, we're not eating that. So she started putting the same things in the smoothies, but put in a lot of berries so that it turned it purple. 
so the kids could see that it was purple. And so they, they started eating it, and they would, this is great, or started drinking it, and they loved it. And she says, well, that one, that green one, it's got the same things as in this purple one. So the, the young children started, tried, they tried the green one and said, hey, this is good. And the next thing, all the kids were telling their parents, you've got to get the kale and the spinach out of the garden so you can make us a smoothie. And so it just slowly, I mean, it, it wasn't overnight. I mean, that took years for people in our community to engage with those foods that they'd never, ever engaged with before. And now people really, really want those foods. And the garden, up until this, this year, was continuing to grow. But what is happening in our community, we just started scanning. We just started, and I'm sure many of you know what happened in Kamloops, uh, um, where they found those unmarked graves. And so it started, as part of the TRC, it started this movement for communities, indigenous communities throughout Canada to do scanning of these former boarding school sites. And we just started the scanning. And even though what they're doing with the scanning, it's all um, they can't share um, what they find. And they won't until they actually have a report out. So we won't know for probably the next year what's happening in our community. But we know that there's some that that they found something because they've asked Gail to remove her garden, and it was the hardest thing for her. I was there when she had to take the plants out, and she was crying because that was nine years of her life. But when it when they finished the scanning, um, she said, "The garden I'm going to put back in there is going to be bigger and better because we're going to." whatever they find under there is going to be released. Thank you for your question. Thanks so much for sharing your story, Charlotte. Um, you speak about indigenous food sovereignty and really emphasize how it's grown in community. It's based in community. And mm. here in this room, we're a lot of non-indigenous folks and members of the students, there's members of the public what would you like to see folks who are not members of indigenous communities do or perhaps not do to mm -hmm. support indigenous food sovereignty? Mm -hmm. I think creating awareness to be part of that and just helping us create awareness around the importance of it. To understand if you are a harvester or as some people call foraging, that you are in somebody's traditional territory to be respectful of that. Um, and I say these to my students because I teach about these foods and I tell my students, all my students, regardless if they're indigenous or non-indigenous, go out and, and access these foods. And I have my students come back, to my come back to my classes or email me and say, I just made myself a great nettles tea and, or I put something, you know, dandelion leaves in my salad. I say, good, because I want you all to experience that, these foods that we um, that we lived on, that we thrived on, but also be respectful of those areas where that where you're harvesting. And if it is all, can recognize as traditional territory, contact people in that community or contact that community to make sure that it's okay. But always to be respectful. So that's that's what I ask to help us to uh, create that awareness about the importance of these foods and be respectful when you also are out either, you know, fishing or harvesting or, you know, in those territories of indigenous peoples. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yes. Okay, we'll take two more. <laughs> and then okay. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for your talk. Um, I love seeing the uh, message we're all interconnected. That's so beautiful. Do you find, what activities do you find are most helpful in helping folks understand this? And do you find differences between indigenous and non-indigenous communities in learning and grokking, if you will, the idea of interconnectedness? Um, in 
Can you, I, I think I kind of missed some of what you were saying. What, can you repeat? Okay, sorry. Um, so I love seeing about the, the idea about interconnectedness. Yes. Okay. And what activities or what ways, how do you promote the waves of knowing about interconnectedness? How do you generate that knowledge? And do you find that there's a difference between indigenous and non-indigenous communities in coming to understand and to, to be interconnected? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, I, I think the realizations of this interconnectedness, you have to come to as an individual and in understanding it. But we are place-based societies and indigenous people. So our connections are to those places and spaces. So we experience it in a very different way, at least some of us. I mean, 50% of indigenous peoples are urban because we've been forced out of our communities because our communities can't sustain our, our societies anymore because we've been forced into small, um, onto small reserves here in Canada or small reservations in the United States or those territories that did once flourish with, with, um, the, with these foods, with our ha'um, no longer do because many of them have been decimated by forestry companies, by for, the forestry industry, logging, mining. Um, but the, the, the interconnectedness is something that is reality for indigenous peoples because our cultures are embedded in those landscapes. Um, so I don't, for non-indigenous, it's very hard for me to, to um, explain to, a, I think, a non-indigenous person what you need to do. Um, but I think it, it is just really understanding and being, um, uh, being um, culturally aware of the places you're in. I say this to my students when I, in my classes, wherever you live, understand where that place is because there, it is, um, there is indigenous, it is a, a one time it was in an indigenous territory or is still recognized as indigenous ancestral territory. Recognize, um, um, understand that history, understand um, the relationship that the indigenous peoples had or still have to those landscapes and be respectful of that which is you know, what I share with everybody. You know, it's not that we're trying to force anyone away from anything or to do anything. It's just respect what we're trying to do. Just be, you know, respect that that Hachatakma Tsawak is so important to who we are as um, New Channel peoples or as Tsishat peoples to connect, or at least for many of us, many of especially the young ones, reconnecting to those landscapes in that very profound and spiritual way. And it's a process for us. It's not, you know, I don't want to romanticize that that's the way we live, you know, and I still remember the, um, uh, if any of you know the Spokane author Sherman Alexi, I remember I was at a talk, uh, one of his talks many years ago, and he says, everybody thinks we wake up and kiss the ground before we walk out the door, you know, or kiss the ground as we're walking out. And he says, no, because that's just romanticizing who we are. There's just so many things that we're still trying to figure out because we're still in the process of decolonizing. Settler colonialism still impacts us on an everyday basis. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Hi there. Um, I was really curious, following up a little bit on what you just said, um, how you see food sovereignty looking for urban indigenous mm. peoples and whether you had any just stories or thoughts on um, how that can go and how that's going already and whether that's kind of a, an aspect of the movement that you study as well. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't. I mean, I didn't look at it in, in this book or focus on it, but it was. It's part of my reality. I live in Seattle. You know, so even though I never think of myself as urban, I am because I still 
um, it, I'm very connected to my community and go home as much as I can. So I just feel like my heart is always there, my spirit is always there. But it is a reality for indigenous peoples living in urban centers. I mean, what do you do? What if you're not living in your territory? You know, if I was living here in Vancouver or living in Washington State where I am, I'm not in my traditional territory. So I am an outsider, If even if I'm indigenous, when I go harvesting, in, the, in that area, which I do, I have to understand that I'm an outsider doing that. So it really, um, it's something that I think, again, just being aware of and um, uh, understanding if you aren't in your territory or if you're in an urban center, it is going to be difficult, but there's a way to do it. I mean, I, I've done it, and I, it, it isn't easy. It would be easier for me to go into Safeway in Seattle and pick up a package of salmon if I want to stay connected to salmon, but I know that it's a, such a different experience if I do that other than going home and, and uh, and fishing with my sister and then cooking salmon that we, you know, that we caught ourselves or salmon we caught in our community, um, our community net. So it is, there's a lot of difficulties there and I just say, you know, just really tr try to find out how you can do it and how you can stay connected as an indigenous person living in an urban center. And it's interesting you're asking that because many times when I've given talks, since, since March when my book came out, I've given quite a few book talks. And that's usually a question that comes up from, especially from an indigenous person living in an indigenous center. And one of my good friends, Matika Wil Wilbur, who did this beautiful photo exhibit, and I don't know if, if any of you have heard about it here. She took photos of every, people from all 562 indigenous nations in the United States. And it became just this massive film project. She's an amazing, amazing person. And she was at one of my book talks. She says, well, what about me, Charlotte? <laughs> I can't get out. When am I going to have time to get out and go harvesting berries? I said, well, Matika, that's up to you to figure out, not me. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for that question. Charlotte, thank you so much for your informative and gracious answers and such a vivid um, talk for all of us. So please, can we give Charlotte a oh. hand? <laughs> and I just want to thank the, uh, the, all the people involved in the President's Dream Colloquium um, for bringing me here. I really appreciate it. I've been treated so well. Thank you to the students who shared your beautiful food with us today at our potluck. I really enjoyed listening to your stories as well and sharing some of your personal history with me. And to all of you who came today, I especially in this storm out there, I said, will anybody come? <laughs> I didn't even want to cross the street from the hotel I was staying in. It was so bad. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. I raise my hands to all of you in appreciation. Pleco, pleco, thank you. Thank you.